Welcome to Sunday Night News and Nonsense. And let me tell you, folks, we've got some pretty interesting topics today. And uh, to start, a fo- start us off, Total OS today is going to pick the first news topic. How are you doing, Total OS, today? I'm doing terrific. How are you, my man? Uh, I'm hanging in there like a loose tooth. Ow! Oh, poor baby. Anyway, hang in there, Spatch. <laughs> Oh jeez, it's it's it started, folks. I can't even do the first. <laughs> I, I, I was I, I was actually doing the 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 sound of the tiniest fiddle playing the saddest song just for uh, me. Oh. <laughs> All right. Yes, it is another Sunday night news and nonsense report or sinner. Uh, you can guess who is the sinner, who is the victim. Uh, but let's get <laughs> yes, let's get right to the very first article. Now I don't know how this happens, Spatry, but. It says here that apparently 20% of Mac computers are infected with Windows malware. Now, my question is... <laughs> you got to be kidding me. That's how I read it uh, about, uh, you know, a few days ago. So it's like, how does that oh, work? Goodness. You tell me. Uh, how does I, it? Because I don't well, have a clue. Yeah. Well, because well, the thing is, Mac is, is uh, based on Unix. Okay. So how? Doop, 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 doop. Yep. Yeah, and of course, and of course, which is completely different than Windows. Okay, you can't run Mac applications in Windows, and uh, any Windows applications that are running in Mac have to be specifically written for it to be able to run. Yeah. So, uh, what did the article go on to say? What kind of malware? Apparently, it's it's uh, some kind of Trojan. Uh, I would imagine a rather sophisticated Trojan. And apparently, this Trojan has hit uh, quite a few max, half a million. Wow. And uh, it says here that a security fir- firm has analyzed this, and it found that it's, it's spreading to like 20%. Of this is it, w- it was designed for Windows, so <laughs> this is just too funny. But uh, <laughs> these hackers are pretty sophisticated, aren't they? Yeah, I'd say so. Why do they call them Trojans? Because the first thing that comes to mind when I hear the word Trojan is never mind. Well, it's I won't go there, but of course the famous <laughs> Greek. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. Here we go. No, no. You know because of the Greek you story. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes, you were, you were going to talk about the Trojan horse. Yes, absolutely. And <laughs> no, it's something you keep in your wallet. Okay. Well, on that note, I still. If somebody out there knows how this works, we you know Windows malware affecting Macs. This is pretty funny. <laughs> Uh, maybe they're consolidating their companies to form one company. WinMac. I have no idea. <laughs> Spatry, Spatry, what's the next news item? Okay. Uh, as, uh, GNOME 3.4.1 has been officially released. And cool. As usual, with a maintenance release, the GNOME or Genome or whatever you want to call it, 3.41 update brings important fixes and various improvements among various packages such as Baobab, Brazero. You know, cool. I I hate Brazero. That that makes more coffee coasters, but maybe maybe they've actually fixed it. They've got uh, some improvements on Empathy, Eye of Genome, GCal Tool, GDM, GTK Plus, Mouse Tweaks, Nautilus, Vino, Yelp. Gnome Terminal, Gnome System Monitor, Gnome Shell, Gnome S- Settings Daemon, Gnome Session, Gnome Screenshot, <sighs> Gnome Panel, that's Gnome Key. A, that's a lot, yes. Yeah, so apparently they've done a lot to uh, fix numerous things. So those people who do like uh, Gnome, um, or Genome, or Gnome, or whatever you want to call it, um, that's that. Cool. That should be a breath of uh, good news for some people. Yay! I like using GNOME. Uh, I still haven't gotten over GNOME 2, but you can do a few things with GNOME 3. You know, log out and log in if you downloaded the correct you know add-ons to make it act a little bit like GNOME 2. But you know what? Look, GNOME 3 apparently is the future. 
It's not. It's going to be going into the future. Obviously, not in the past. Dump the dump. But I think it's great that the updates keep coming to make it a more of a polished system. So good for them. Interestingly enough, though, uh, they have a website, and I can't remember where it is, but I uh, I did a report on this on my show uh, a few months ago, where you can actually add functionality to GNOME uh, through your web browser, and there's a site where you could download some different things, and even Linus Torvalds himself uh, made mention of this, where uh, he's starting to see that the community is starting to do things with the new GNOME shell, and you know, bringing some functionality to it, but still, really, I think they need to bring back the right click on the panel. You decide what yes. um, applications you have on the panels and that sort of thing. You decide how you want it to behave and that sort of thing. And pretty much, what they really need to do is to put the control back in the user's hands. I would have to. Uh, I would have to totally agree. Make it more user friendly. The Kiss method. Keep it simple. Stupid. I mean, that's exactly. that's what it comes down to. Okay, do you have something else, or do I have something else? I lost track here. Um, Microsoft supporting open source threat or promise. Another news uh, piece hot off the press here. Just because Microsoft formed a new company, company strictly for handling open source code doesn't mean they've suddenly had a change of heart regarding software patents. Fact is... There's big money in patent ownership within the software space. And while I'm personally not a fan, Microsoft is quite content in pursuing software patents as part of their business. After looking at the issue, I feel that Microsoft first began embracing open source because they had to. While I doubt we'll see much of it on the desktop, they're embracing it quite heavily within the enterprise space. Hyper-V is one such example of how Microsoft has seen the value in working closely with the open source community. But despite this cooperation between open source community and Microsoft, the idea is that Linux will be the guest operating system in this equation. Uh, as long as uh, MS continues to support ATI drivers, I'm a happy camper. <laughs> That's all that I could say on that, but yeah. You, you're never going to – folks, no. this is what I have to deal with, okay? It's He's about talking about time. what he has to deal with. I have to, I have to listen to this shiznitz every week about ATI, ATI, ATI. You know, and the thing is I'm running an ATI card. I've got the XORG drivers. I've got my card configured properly just using standard XORG, and it's working nicely. Well, goody two-shoes to you, yes. And, and then you've got and then you've got horse stable over here that doesn't want to bother to look at the look at the uh, configuration files. He just wants a one click solution to fix the problem. I mean, that's the whole point of running Linux. Here. I'm going to wait for the day. <laughs> let, let, just let me chime in, and then we'll wrap this up, Mister uh, Stable there in the South America, Florida, Mister Coffee Bean. I'm waiting for the day where you download a piece of Windows software that you need. That certified whatever, stable, tested, and it crashes. And you're going to come whining to me, and I will say, I'm sorry, Spatch, we have a bad connection. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I've had that happen before, though. Oh, okay. I've had, th I've had that happen. Okay. Um, now, not not in the most recent years, but there uh -huh. have been times where uh, where I'd go out and buy a new piece of hardware and use the made for and it had a made for Windows disk. You go to install the driver, and the driver doesn't even work that well. Yeah. And you know, my personal experience, and this is uh, this is a pro tip for all of you Windows users out there. I'm still running Windows, and believe me, we don't hate Windows because we both use it. Yes. We just we just pr have a preference for Linux here, but the thing is, whenever you buy a new piece of hardware, the first thing you do is throw away the disk that comes with it, and you go on the manufacturer's website and download the latest driver. Usually, I've had better results doing it that way than installing the driver that came with the CD. I don't even I don't even keep the driver disks. I'll actually just go on the website and download them, and I actually have a text file. Uh, for my Windows operating systems of the places that you go to download these drivers because, you know, obviously in 
running Windows, I I like to keep all my drivers up to date and that sort right, of thing. Right. Right. And as part of my regular maintenance routine, after defragging and uh, uh, cleaning my registries and that sort of thing, I'll do a check from time to time. And this is usually something that's done maybe once every two months. I'll go and I'll check and see if there's an updated version of the drivers, and I'll manually do that, since obviously uh, Windows doesn't really have. <clears throat> package management like Linux does where it can um, uh, where, where it can uh, yeah, scan and make yeah. sure that all your drivers are up to date and that sort of thing and that, now yes I have seen uh, Windows update providing some driver updates for some things but if you're getting the driver directly from the manufacturer's website you usually don't have to download the uh, Microsoft version of the driver so fair enough okay all right, so let's wrap this up. You had mentioned something before about Wubi, so what's up with that? Okay, um, now you indicated that you've used this before. We had a pre-show chat here. Now I have somebody that uh, mentioned that um, yes, that they're using the Mint variant of that, which allows you to uh, install Linux into a folder on yes. your TFS file yes. system for yes. testing Linux. Yes. Okay, now. He's having trouble connecting onto the internet every time he wants to go online. He has to put in his password every time, and it's just not remembering everything. Okay. Now, um, uh, explain to me how this Wubi thing really works. Is Are you actually running Linux from within Windows, or uh, are you booting your computer into Linux and it's just reading the files on your hard drive? Okay. Or what, I, what yeah. I have not used Wubi in a while, and I think... I think in Linux Mint they don't call it Wubi. I believe it's called Mint for Win. Yes, or, that's, uh, that's the all one. Right. Now, it's been a while, so my memory's a little rusty, but if I recall, I had it working like this. Number one, you must have your Windows 7 or, I guess, Windows Vista. You must have it clean, meaning run a virus scanner, run a spyware scanner, clean it out, reboot if necessary. Don't forget to defrag. That will affect performance. You defrag. Wash, rinse, and repeat. Yes, wash, rinse, and repeat. A little bit of bleach, you know, something in the dryer for the dryer sheets, and you're good to go. Okay, thank you. You clean it out, and then you follow the Wubi instructions. I believe it's pretty simple. You can either uh, download Wubi itself or download Mint or download Linux Mint or Ubuntu, burn it on the disk, and then boot into that Wubi installer, I think. It'll have you put your username, password, how much of the hard drive space you want to allocate, and install. The last time I did it took maybe 10, 15 minutes. It's done. You reboot twice, I think, twice. Mm -hmm. You now have the choice to boot into Windows 7 or Linux Mint or Ubuntu. That's the last thing I remember. It's that simple. Performance is affected by maybe 10%, a little bit slow, but it seems stable. But from what I understand, it's not always 100% stable. For me, it was. But it is a safe way to try Linux Mint. Okay, and I made a suggestion to that viewer. I can't. I apologize. I can't remember your name. That um, I had suggested installing uh, Linux Mint onto a USB flash drive with a persistence. You can go on pendrivelinux.com and download the utility to do that from within Windows. And then um, anything you install on your uh, on your USB install, and obviously you're going to boot the computer from the USB. It will remember your settings. It will remember um, your network password, so you won't have to type in your password every time. And this would be a good way for you to try out Linux until you're ready to take the plunge and start dual booting with it. Cool. That sounds about right. Spatry, on that note, I think we are done for this another fantastically funny Sunday Night News and Nonsense <laughs> Report. Uh, I think I will have a lot less trouble editing this one. Thank you. Uh, for joining me again for another <laughs> Sinner Report with Mr. Beefy Miracle in South America, Florida. And remember, folks, the only safe place to keep a Trojan is in your wallet. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>